Hey guys, uh, Barry William E. Maglady back for another episode of the Comeback Game podcast. Uh, today I've got Michael O'Brien, who's an executive coach, speaker, author of uh, Last Bad Day and uh, slayer of Your Last Bad Day. Michael, how you doing, mate? Barry, very awesome to be with you guys um, and with your listeners. A longtime listener and now, um, I guess I will say, first time guest. So I'm, I'm totally pumped to be with you. Mate, we're super stoked to have you here. Uh, where are you calling in from today? Uh, right outside of New York City in the state. So I live in technically New Jersey, but I, like I can see the city from where we live. Yeah. So it's like 9 a.m. there or something? Yeah, 9 a.m. bright and early this Thursday morning. So a good way to start getting to talk to you. And then once we get done, I'm going to get on my bike and go for a little bit of a ride. Yeah, cool. So uh, before we get too far into it, why don't you just share with the listeners today uh, a little bit about yourself? Sure. Well, I, you know, I was um, a guy that was following the script that I thought society wanted me to play. And I know you've, you've talked about this with past guests. So coming out of university, mm. I basically thought, well, you come out of university, get a degree, um, get a gig, meet a girl, marry a girl, start a family, buy a house, work your way up the corporate ladder. And I was doing like all that, I think, fairly well. And I Long story short, I spent 22 years in corporate America, mainly in healthcare. And then Mm. in 2014, I decided to take a leap into being an entrepreneur, starting my business as a coach and a speaker and an author. But along that way, I had, as your introduction uh, said, I had my last bad day on July 11th, 2001. It was a day I got hit head on by a Ford Explorer and SUV when I was out on a bike ride. And it's the day that changed everything for me. It shifted my perspective in almost every aspect of my life. And it's a day where I call it my last bad day, but in a lot of ways, it was one of my better ones. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a bit more about that because as you know, like listening to the comeback game and a lot of the guys and and girls that have been listening for a while now, you know, that the premise around what we, what we do here is, is really, I suppose, to shine a light uh, into people's closets and and help them to realize and to be okay with the challenges and adversities that come up in life because I honestly believe that you know like we never get given anything you know God the universe never gives us anything we're not prepared to handle and I honestly believe that that, that the challenges and the setbacks the adversities that we have become our greatest teachers if we let them uh, so let's talk a bit, a bit about that like like what was going on for you prior to that bike accident? Yeah, so prior to the bike accident, I would say I wasn't living my life with any type of awareness. I was, I, if you had met me, like on the surface, things looked pretty um, cool beans, right? I had a really great gig. I was the marketing director for my company's biggest product. A lot of pressure, though. I would often say if we sneeze, the whole company caught the flu because we were the reason we came from Japan to the States. So, but a big job. And I was, I, I love the work, mm. but I also felt like I had to be like Superman at work because I was the leader. I thought I had to have all the answers. And that role didn't change too much when I went home because I was the father of two young girls. My wife and I had been married seven years at the time. We've, we'll celebrate 25 years here in two weeks. Um, mm. So the story got better over time. But I thought I had to be Superman at home too because I was the provider I was the breadwinner and what I was doing was pouring a lot of stress inside of me and trying to pretend like hey I'm all good we're all fine and I would just pour the stress inside and and try to repress it try to restrict it in a lot of ways Barry I was chasing happiness which I know you've talked to many people and the people you coach where it's like I conditionalize my happiness I'll be happy when I get promoted I'll be happy when I make more money I'll be happy when I buy that new car or what have you. And so, and, and I really thought I was doing what society wanted me to do. I thought that was part of the script because, Hey, they pay you for a reason because it's stressful. Like, you know, suck it up and, and do it. And I wasn't living my life with any type of mindfulness. I didn't even know about that at the time or awareness or a lot of the qualities. Now, now I, how I live my life and you know, to your point, God, universe, whatever, it gives us things that we can handle. And I think, Mm -hmm. you know, when I look back, I had a lot of signs to say, hey, hey, hit the pause button, breathe, 
Mm. Think about how you want to show up. But I was so busy doing, I was so busy on that hamster wheel that I blew past them. I didn't even see them. So the universe was like, hey, listen, dude, um, you, keep, you keep on ignoring all of our signs. We're going to give you one big massive one. And we're going to send this SUV your way. And all that stress that you've been pouring inside, we're going to literally and figuratively knock that out of you with one big accident. And that's now how I look at it. In the beginning, like in the early days of my recovery, where I thought like I wanted life to be different because as they put me onto the helicopter to take me to the trauma center, I made a commitment that if I live, life would be different. I'd stop chasing happiness. But in the first several weeks of my recovery, life was different in a very dark way. I was bitter. I was angry. I wanted revenge against the driver. And then ultimately, I had my big aha or my big shift where I started to see life much differently. Mm. Mm. And, and like that aha, that shift, was it something that, that you feel came through you? Was it something that you, you created yourself? You know, like, like this is often the thing that I'm curious about. Was it, was it, an, was it a conscious thought? Was it something that you feel that you physically did or was it something that was done upon you? I think it's really, you know, for, at least for me, it was a combination. I, I, I believe this, that like our success in life happens in the moments between our moments. Mm. So a lot of times we talk about the big aha, mm. but there are a lot of little micro ahas that lead up to that. And so, I think what was happening for me is that I was starting to pay a little bit more attention because I did make that commitment, you know, and, and I really was in a life and death situation because on that day I broke a whole bunch of everything and the left femur shattered. It just exploded by the impact. And what happened was my femoral artery of my left leg was severed because the bone just like sliced it like a knife. And so the doctors told my wife, had I been 10 years older or not healthy at the time, I certainly would have passed away before I even got to the hospital. Uh, but that frame of mind early on, because they shared with me after I came out of the ICU, like, hey, Michael, you're going to have a life of pain and suffering, more surgeries, dependencies, limitations. And in the whole spirit of we go where our eyes go, I went to a dark place. All I saw was everything I had lost, everything I couldn't do anymore. But slowly but surely, I was like, I, I knew enough intellectually that I was like, I gotta get my mindset right, but I was struggling. It was like such the resistance because the reality that was being painted for me and where I wanted to go was like running up against a brick wall. So I think I had a lot of those moments. And then I got to the big aha, and that was during our physical rehabilitation session where I just looked around the room, I paused. It's, it seemed to last for like five minutes, but it was really more like 15 seconds. I just sort of scanned the room and I, and I wondered like, hey, some of the patients there were getting better and some were plateauing and some were actually getting worse. And I was in the camp where I was just sort of plateauing. I wasn't making enough progress. And I wonder like, what's getting in their, what's getting in their way or what's accelerating the other people? And I realized it's like, it's how they're showing up, their frame of how they look at their injury. And that choice, right? That choice of like, do I want to stay a victim? Because that was my narrative in the beginning. Or do I want something more out of life? And at the time, as, as corny as this sounds, I looked for another V word. Like, so what's the opposite of victim? It's victor, right? So I was like, I'm going to be a victor. I'm going to be resilient. And I knew then that I had to like shift my mindset and really tap into the resilience that I, that I knew was within me. But mm -hmm. up until that point, I really couldn't recruit. So mm -hmm. a little bit of a little bit of both. I think I started, the moment came to me that I had enough awareness at least then, to accept it, right? There was enough space. Mm. Before in my life, all those signs and you know signals, I didn't have any space because I was so busy doing. I was so busy mm. on the hamster wheel that I never even saw them. I just blew past them. Mm. And uh, like you talk about like uh, this shift in this our home and, and, and obviously a state, uh, state shift in your thinking, did you find that it was a once off thing or, or has it been something that you, you still to this day continually work with to, to kind of keep you on the straight and narrow and keep your eyes focusing on what you'd like? It's a, from that moment, I made a dedication very to start my, start my days differently, to frame my days differently. So it's 
call it intentionality, call it a practice, you know, throw in some discipline, but it's like, you know, waking up every day uh, with gratitude and I developed a gratitude practice as well, which was sort of a cornerstone to my recovery and really working on how can I become more aware today than I was yesterday. Mm. So, so I have, I have the space, I have, I can see what's, what's happening around me, but I also can feel like what's happening with me. Right. Cause what I love, you've said this before, like, sort of like all business problems are really personal problems. Right. So in so many words or less. And so, so when I look at managing my business, I want to better understand who I am and when that little inner critic gets going or that voice in my head and all that. So I've really, you know, sort of put on a path to become more aware. I mean, I guess current day, we'd, we'd call it being more mindful about mm-hmm. how I'm showing up not only for myself, but for everyone else around me. Mm. How long did it take of, of like that consistency? Do you feel in that, that, that ritual, that morning ritual before you started to notice significant shifts within your own mindset and your thought, thought program, but also within those around you too? Yeah. I'd love to be able to tell people that this the greatest hack in the world that like the next day, like the skies opened up, yeah. and, you know, but I would say it, it, it took, I would say it took a good several months before I started to see like, okay, well, there's some substance to this, but even along the way, like I know a lot of times, you know, people that have stories like mine, they're like this big aha. And it, and the way we communicate it is like, there's like this linear path up, right. From like the low point to like the pinnacle. Mm-hmm. And my, my journey has been like everything but that, you know, so I've had moments where, you know, I made three steps forward, took four steps back, and I had to like, you know, come back again, right? I had to tap into resilience where I was like, God, like, why do you like, after some surgeries and a couple surgeries, one surgery went sort of south and I developed a massive infection. And I just sat in the hospital wondering like, why do like bad things happen to good people? Like, I'm a good person. Like, why do these things keep on happening to me? And, but then that was, a good like six years into working on more awareness. Um, so it's, I would say it's a sort of a constant discipline. Uh, but certainly when I decided to come back into my corporate life, I started noticing I was showing up differently at work. So let's say stay like, like real, real substance change. I'd say probably a good like nine months to it, a year into it. Um, mm-hmm. And I credit it, you know, I credit, my accident, my recovery, how I chose to go down that path of my recovery to getting me to the executive suite within my company. Uh, Cause I definitely wondered about that. Like what happens like when you almost die, what's the script for that? You know, do you just go back to your same old gig or do you like sell everything and go trekking in Nepal or you do some crazy feat or you, do you quit your job and just start fresh? I wrestled with that in the early part of my recovery. I just didn't know what to do because I had been following a script for the longest time, all the way through my twenties. And now here I am in a a completely different world in my early thirties with a blank sheet of paper and a whole new script to write. Hmm. Like looking back now, so how long ago was your accident? Did you say, sorry? Uh, 2001. So this July, we celebrate 18 years. So at least in the States, it's an officially an adult. So, yeah. <laughs> so, it, so when you look back at that, that now adult experience, um, like what do, you, what do you feel is the biggest learning, the, the, the biggest core uh, takeaway from, from having gone through that? Like obviously there's some significant transformations in terms of you, you had an opportunity to re-choose which path you, you, you wanted to walk in life. But looking back now, was there more to it than that? Was there something more to gain from that experience? I would say like one of the big things that underscored is, now this is my language. So my, my company is called Peloton Coaching. And so, you know, for those listeners that may not know what a Peloton is, it's a group of cyclists in a bike race. So think the Tour de France and, and so it's like community, if you will, I, or it's another metaphor for tribes. And, you know, with my business, like with everyone's business, like we're out front and center, um, even with my book, right? It's like written by me and I'm on the cover. But mm-hmm. what, I, what I really learned in the most powerful way 
is how important your Peloton is, how important your network or your community really are in helping you change the lives you want to change or have success or however you want to say it. You know, I, I knew that. We all know that. Like, oh, yes, it takes a village. But when you live it the way I did, um, it just it, it becomes such a powerful lesson. I'm only here because of everyone around me. You know, and, and that's led by my wife and my daughters, but my medical team, my friends, my extended family, colleagues, people that I didn't even know who, you know, put energy out there, prayed for me, whatever verb you want to use. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm only here because of the strength of those around me. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, I put in a lot of sweat equity. I had to like show up too. But me just showing up as a solo project, I would never have made it to this point, not at all. So like living through that, just that the power and the importance of developing your connections and developing communities, especially nowadays, I think is, is so, so vital to drive mm. whatever definition of success that you want to create. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I think communities are important. You're like, you, you look at these social platforms that were to created to connect us. And yet, you know, you go out to dinner with your friends and, you know, they're all sitting there on their phones around the table on Facebook, you know, like, like it's yeah. just really, you see the way that, that society has gone. And I think that, you know, it's something that, that myself and my partner talked about a lot uh, is the need for, for these communities and, and the yearning that people I think have for that deep connection with another human being. Uh, absolutely. And what, and one of the things too that I learned is just, you know, there were like basically three groups of people when I, you know, when I was in my worst shape, you know, I, I expected that there were certain people in my network that were going to show up and they did. And then there are people who I expected to show up, but didn't. didn't. Yeah. And then there are people that I didn't expect to show up, but did so in a major way. And that was a huge surprise to me. And at first, the people who I expected to show up but didn't, I was judging them pretty harshly. I was like, I can't mm -hmm. believe it. I'm in like my lowest point and you're not here for me. And what I learned over time is that a lot of them just didn't, like it wasn't, it was any, it wasn't anything against me. It was just, they just didn't know how to show up. They didn't know how to be there in that moment. They were uncomfortable and mm -hmm. they were in their own head and, you know, I, I had, you know, I had to go through that. We had to talk through that to really, to, to really discover the, the true meaning of all those different actions. But yeah, I'd say that social media, to your point, Barry, like it's brought us all, you know, it's, it's brought forth a whole bunch of connection, but at the same time, we're so disconnected. Yeah. It's a really, yeah. it's, a, it's an interesting dichotomy. Um, so, and I think it's one that we all have to like, set our own rules in terms of how we, how we're going to navigate social media going forward. Yeah. And I, I think the, you know, it's interesting too, like the, the strong desire to look good, you know, it's, it's that whole, the, the perception of the reality is real than reality itself. And, you know, the way that people, it's like social gives them a chance to express themselves uh, in a desired way rather than necessarily in an authentic way as well absolutely i was just talking to someone the other day about alignment like you know are you the person in in real life that you represent on social right and so we because anything in alignment just runs better right works better more efficient like your car like if your car is out of alignment it doesn't operate as efficiently as and as effectively as it could and i think the same for all of us you know like what do we want to put out there how many filters are we laying on top of ourselves to show us in the, the, the prettiest way, the most beautiful way? And does that, does that jive with, you know, what people would get if they met us in person? And I think that's key as an entrepreneur, as a freelancer, or what have you, when you don't have that alignment, it's hard to run um, a business that can make an impact in people's lives. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting too, like, and it comes back to, to integrity. You know, I remember I did a, did a course a while ago that was, um, that was big around integrity and moving into integrity. And one thing that was really profound for me that I realized is that, you know, often we'll do more to let ourselves down than we will to let, let others down. 
you know, so more often we, we will try to, to, to do the right thing by others at the, at the detriment of the right thing by ourselves. But then if we go and take that to the context of, let's just say, goal setting in business, that if we're, if, if we're living a life, as you, as you share, out of alignment, if we're living a life where we're not following through on our word to others, because often we still let others down and we're not following through our word to ourselves. And then we go and set these you know, ambitious goals. There's, there's no chance, there's not a chance in hell we're going to achieve them because if we're not showing up conditioning ourselves, uh, uh, you know, from a, a space of our inner game and our outer game that what we say we do, how, how is a goal any different? Yes. You know, Love and then that's what I see that people that are in complete alignment with themselves and, and utmost integrity and, and, and do what they say and say what they do, they set a goal and they achieve that goal relatively easily or they're lucky because they have conditioned themselves to follow through on their word. And so when they create this goal, when they write this goal down, it's no different than saying, Hey, I'll be there to pick up the kids at three o'clock. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, no, it's, um, you know, it's, it's honoring your word again to, to others, to yourself. And, but also it's getting, getting some clarity around what you want in this wild, crazy life of ours. Right. So do you, you know, what are those values that you want to honor? What are the boundaries that you want to put up and, and being good with like what you want to go after and not, not necessarily like grab on to like, well, the guy down the, you know, down the hall or down the block is doing X. I got to do X in order to be successful. I think we can have some wonderful, the wonderful spectrum of success current day. And we can be really comfortable with that. Not everyone has to have, an eight figure business or a seven figure business, you know, I, yeah. you know, in the social media world, it's, it seems like that's the benchmark of success. Like, you know, 10 X your life or seven figure, eight figure, nine figure where like, I think most entrepreneurs or most freelancers are just hoping to make like U S dollars here, maybe six figures. Right. So it's just, yeah. um, and, and, get, and getting, Hey, if that's what you want to do, like get comfortable with that and do that and put all your efforts towards making that happen if you are like a seven eight figure kind of guy or gal then yeah that's cool too um yeah you know, but but, I, but I, would, I would question the why though too you know like we've had sure. a number of clients that have come to us that have you know one of these goals and when we've challenged them and gone deep on them realize that that the goal wasn't actually what they wanted what they wanted was the experience that they felt the goal would give them that they could actually get without adding 50 more staff and spending another few million dollars on marketing I remember um, Mark uh, Mason's book, The Subtle Art of, of Not Giving a Fuck. Yes. And I remember distinctly re reading this. We just finished running one of our events in Lombok, actually, and, and uh, I was with my partner. We were on Gilly Island. I was reading his book, and I was just loving it. I remember I got to the section towards the end. It started talking about, like, are your goals actually your goals? And to be honest, I'd never actually really questioned it before then. I'd never really questioned <laughs> whether or not the goals that I was setting for myself in life were actually my own goals because I believe that they always were. And what I realized after reading his book is that, you know, a lot of decisions that I'd made unconsciously were to fit in with social norms, you know, for status or for, for a sense of belonging. And I remember that that significantly changed the way that I looked towards setting goals and it started to become a lot more around what felt right rather than necessarily what I, what I wanted or thought that I needed. Well, that was how, you know, to society's norms or you know, social norms. That's how I love live my life up into my, to my accident. I was, I was following that script. I thought, this is what you do, you know? And I, I had, I really hadn't any, spent any time like trying to understand who I was or what I really wanted. And, you know, once I let go of some of those societal norms or goals, that's when my success really sort of took off where I was just like, I'm going to show up back in my corporate job on my own terms. And I've tried to keep that philosophy you know, when I started my entrepreneurial journey. Although there are times where I would still like early on, I got into that comparison itis, you know, sort of comparing someone's middle to my beginning and be like, Oh, I, I should do that. Or, Oh yeah. yeah, I should do that. And not getting really clear in terms of what I really wanted out of out of my business and, and, and the why behind it. Like how yeah. do I want to shape people's lives and, and help them live a better one? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm curious to hear about, uh, we spoke very briefly. We ended up getting into a deep chat quite quickly before we even uh, hit the record button. 
I'm curious to hear about, um, you know, like you, you said you're the slayer of, of other people's last bad days. And so I'm curious to find out more about that. And, and maybe can you share with the, the, the people listening or watching today uh, around how they can kind of draw a line in the sand and, and make that declaration of, of their last bad day? Because uh, let's, let's hope that we don't all have to go through something as, as, as crazy as you know, getting a head on collision with the UV. For me, it was, it was bankruptcy, you know, eight and a half years ago. That was a really kind of a, a wake up moment for me and a questioning of whether or not I was moving in the right direction. Yeah. So when I, when I reference my last bad day, one of the things I often say to the people I speak with is like, you know, I, I want you to be able to move beyond yours without the pain and suffering that I went through, you know, to me, the last bad day and something that I'm going to launch in July, because I try to do something each July to celebrate my last bad day. So uh, two years ago, as an example, I came out with my book and then last year, I launched a leadership academy. So I try to do look, those big, hairy, audacious goals in July as a statement of like, I'm living life, right? Um, yeah. But I'm living life in a way to help others because I believe that's one of the reasons why I, I lived that day. Yeah. So when I talk about the last bad day and what I'm not, what it's not about is unicorns and rainbows and brightly colored candies and like just everything is rosy because I, I don't want anyone to, den to deny that we all have those emotions of sadness and frustration and anger throughout our days. But for me, that last bad day is that day you decide to live life differently. Mm. So I made a determination when I was in the hospital. I was like, okay, July 11th, 2001, that day obviously was the day of my accident. I go, that's going to be my last bad one. Because what I realized during my recovery is that all the events in our lives, Barry, are neutral until we label them. And we have agency, we have choice in how we label our days. And so we'll have, again, maybe a bad moment or a sad moment during the day, but I don't want five minutes on Friday that are maybe bad in a meeting to spill into a bad Friday, which then spills into or cascades into a bad weekend, which mm. then cascades into a bad week so for me the last bad day is like okay today is the day i'm going to live life differently with awareness and mindfulness and resilience and vulnerability and courage and empathy and gratitude and generosity and all those wonderful qualities and yes i'm going to have my bad moments i'm going to have sad moments but at the end of the day i get to choose how i label it and i don't have to label it as bad i can have a sad day mm -hmm. i can have a maybe a frustrating day, but even when I'm sad, even when I'm just experiencing, say the emotion of sadness, I can still be grateful. I can still yeah. see some of the positive things during the course of the day. And, you know, during, during my recovery on September 11th, 9-11 here in the States, and really across the world, I was in the hospital when that happened. And obviously that was a sad day, not only for us in the States, but again, across most of the world. And so I experienced, like a whole bunch of folks, the emotion of sadness. But at the end of the day, I still had a lot of gratitude. Mm. I had a gratitude for my family. I had gratitude for the first responder, the first responders. So I, like, as I sort of cataloged that day, I didn't catalog it as a bad day. I, I experienced a whole bunch of different emotions, but there were things I could still take to build upon to go into the next day. So for me, um, what I'll share with people when we get to July are a different, different type of roadmap to one, to frame our day. So I think it's really important to frame our day in, a, in the right way with intentionality in terms of how we want to show up, what are our priorities, working on our, not only our body, but also on our mind to get those fired up. So we can set forth in terms of like, how do I want to like show up not only for myself, but for others throughout the day um, to start there. Cause what happens too often is that we wake up right next to our cell phone. And the first thing that we do is we start to check our email or our socials and already we get on that hamster wheel and we're, our day is framed in, in everything that we missed from last night and everything that we need to do. And we're not present in the moment. We just start reacting. Mm. And then we take that energy into work and we just react and we're not present 
we're not connecting with the people around us. And then we finish off that day with like probably a whole bunch of email and we pour ourselves into, into bed. And then we get to the end of the day and we may not necessarily label it as a bad one, but it's sort of like a blah day. It's like any other day. And we lose, we lose some of the goodness in the day, right? Cause we're hardwired to pay attention to threats and worry and all that good stuff like that. Whereas we can, frame our day in the morning, spend some time being mindful throughout our day, making connections and really listening to others to build that type of connection. And we frame our days in the evening before we hit the pillow with some gratitude and further connection. Well, then we can see some of the goodness in the day. And it could just be micro things. It may not be like big, like birthday party celebrations, but those little things in life um, as a way to choose our label choose how we, we want to uh, catalog our days. And so what I, what I want to try to do in July is help, um, you know, it's, it's big, hairy and audacious, but over the next year, I want to help a million people like show up differently in life mm. um, as, a, as a way to start. And I think, you know, it's, it's one of the things I'm really excited about. How does, how does someone like consciously create that and and choose that and have the discipline like you shared before several months of of you showing up differently before you really start to notice change like you know in in the world that we live in right now everyone's competing for our attention right and and unfortunately the one thing that hasn't changed is the amount of time that we all have each and every day so how does how does someone consciously choose to to, de- to not only declare that has been the last the last bad day but declare to, to choose more of those positive emotions and have the discipline to, to stay on track and not fall into bad, bad habits? Well, I think it starts with a certain level of dissatisfaction with what may be like a series of bad days that someone may be living with or just a series of flawed days, right? So because mm-hmm. without, without some of the, te- you know, we need some tension to create change. Yeah. And, You know, so we have to have either it comes from an external source or it comes from within us that dissatisfaction that I want to live differently. You know, I'm tired of living this way where every day seems to be meh, blah, or bad, or what have you, because I'm not stepping into that definition of success that I want. So I think it starts there. And then there are little micro steps each day, you know, like, I had like my big aha, but I do believe like my success over time has been built by maybe small pedal strokes or small steps and the discipline over time to bring about that change. And, Mm -hmm. and so certainly along the way, I've had like those bad moments. Um, And, and, and I, what I set forth though is the intentionality that each day I'm going to try to step into this. And if I have a day where maybe I'm not, as disciplined as I wish I could have been, I just, I take that as not an invitation to beat myself up. Cause a lot of mm-hmm. times we set forth, I'm like, okay, we're going to make these changes in our lives. And that one day we were, we sort of fall off the wagon. Then it's like this open invitation to say like, who are you kidding? Like, why'd you even start this in the first place? You're, you can't do this. And we get in our own head. And then all of a sudden that one bad moment turns into a bad day. And then the next day we don't do it. Because we're like, who are we kidding, right? We're not going to be able to do this. But it's, it's showing up each morning with like, okay, here's how I want to live my life. And at least set our compass on, in terms of being aware of what's happening around us. And I think that's, you know, that's the power, I think, of a mindfulness practice as well as coupling that with a gratitude practice to help, you know, sort of help point our eyes in a different direction so we can see what we still have we can also see and appreciate what we still can do. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And trust that, that uh, everyone listening and watching this today has got a lot out as well. Uh, Michael, like how could the guys connect with you? They want to find out more around declaring their last bad day. Uh, so what's the, the best way to connect with you? Yeah. So the best way is to head to my website, which is Michael O'Brien shift.com. And there, they can learn about my book, uh, which all the proceeds of the of shift creating better tomorrows goes to charity. So since I lost my mobility, I really when I set off to write it, I wanted to do something to help 
enhance someone else's mobility because you know I took my health for granted and I took my mobility for granted and until my accident I, I didn't have my health and I didn't have my, my mobility so all the proceeds go to an organization that's based in the states called World Bicycle Relief and they help girls in countries like Kenya and Malawi and Zaire conquer the challenge of distance by giving them a bicycle and they get to stay oh, in school that. longer and they graduate and have more economic vitality so the, someone can uh, learn about the book there, but just, you know, check out all the different social media places and all that good stuff. And a little bit more of my story by going to michaelobrienship.com. Yeah. I'd love that. Love that. Um, I, I got a question too. I, I got, I got to, I got to ask for all the, all the, all the listeners and all the watchers today is what I'd love is wherever, whatever platform you're listening to this on today, whatever platform you're watching this on, uh, just put a comment, let us know where you're from. Uh, the interesting thing that I find is that since we launched this, we've had nearly a million people download the episodes uh, in the past 10, 11 months. And we're all the time hearing from people that, that, have, that have listened, that have uh, had some form of transformation or, 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 you know, heard that perfect episode at the perfect time. I'd love to know how far we've spread. So if you're watching or listening to this today, just uh, comment with either an emoji of a flag of where you're from or uh, where your hometown is. I'd love to see how far the comeback game and the comeback nation has gone. Uh, Michael O'Brien, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. I've loved chatting with you and, uh, to be honest, could have kept chatting some more. So maybe we'll get you back for another episode. That would be cool, Barry. I'd love it. And to all your listeners, I hope uh, they got a pearl or two out of our conversation. But I've been, I, as I mentioned up front, been a listener of your podcast. So I'll put a little emoji there on the, on the website with the U.S. flag. And um, I'm honored that you had me on. Yeah. Mate, grateful you're here. And uh, thanks so much for your time. You bet. Thanks, Barry.